I know that in my last iceberg, I said I wasn't going to make any more of these, but when have I ever kept my promises? I've been lying to you since day one. Now, this began as something entirely different. It was going to be a narrative type video about the projects of various high profile directors that were never made. But during the research process, I came across a lot of topics that didn't really fit that video, but which still made for great content. And so I came to the conclusion that the iceberg was the best format to discuss them. Now, this topic has been talked about before in cancelled or lost movie icebergs, but the difference here is that those videos are made using charts made by people who aren't the YouTuber. I make my own icebergs, which does upset some people, but it means that the topics I talk about are interesting to me. You won't be seeing the likes of a day with Spongebob Squarepants or the day the clown cried on here, because one, I talked about them in other icebergs, and two, I want to focus on more obscure stuff that you hopefully haven't heard of. Because not all the films I'm going to talk about are lost or cancelled, I'm stuck with a very long title. So without further ado, this is the Films You Will Never See Iceberg. Obviously, we're going to start with the most recent news in unreleased films. Batgirl by Adil L. R. B. and Bilal Falah. In May of 2021, Batgirl was announced as an HBO Max original and another installment in the DCEU. The film began shooting in November of that year and ended in March of 2022. The film would have starred Leslie Grace as Batgirl and Michael Keaton reprising his role as Batman. Following a messy merger between Warner Media and Discovery, it was announced that the film would no longer be released. The news even shocked the cast and crew, who only heard of this decision after it was reported on. While the film did have poor test screenings, the more likely answer behind this decision was due to cost-cutting measures implemented by new CEO and President David Soslov, who felt that using Batgirl as a tax write-off, along with other films and shows, would work better at recouping its cost than actually releasing the film. And this procedure hasn't really been working out for them. Secret screenings were shown for the cast and crew before the film was sent to the Warner Brothers archives, never to be seen again. This event reveals two truths. One, the DCEU can literally never catch a break. And two, studios, distributors, financers, and everything in between will always find a way to screw over people's films. Most films are made with the intention of being seen by the public after completion, and the same is true for every film on this list, except 100 years. With the tagline, the movie you will never see, 100 Years is an experimental sci-fi short film written by and starring John Malkovich and directed by Robert Rodriguez. The film was made as an advert for Louis XIII, a cognac produced by Remy Martin that takes over 100 years to make. We know very little about the film's story. The only thing confirmed is the cast consisting of John Malkovich, Shuya Chang, and Marco Zoror. The film will be released in 2115, and invitations have already been sent out to hundreds of guests, which are meant to be passed down to their descendants. Three teasers were made for the film, consisting of the same scenario being played out in different environments, titled Retro, Nature, and Future. Now listen, I don't want to be a party pooper, but if the teaser is anything to go by, well, I'm not setting my expectations too high. Thrilling. Hey. What are you guys doing here? But hey, maybe the film turned out to be great, and your great-great-grandkids can come back to this video and rub in my face how wrong I was.
Before Tarantino became a well-known director, he was working at a video rental store. In 1984, he and friend Craig Hammond took a shot at writing and filming a low-budget feature film. The plot follows a man trying to comfort his friend on his birthday after his girlfriend breaks up with him. Filming took place over four years on a budget of only $5,000. The film was meant to have a runtime of 70 minutes, but only 36 minutes exist. This is because Tarantino was unsatisfied with how his footage turned out, and instead of completing it, he edited what he did like and moved on to his next project. A popular rumor spread that the remaining footage burned in a film lab, but Tarantino denies this, saying he let the rumor spread initially because it made it for a cooler story. Tarantino has expressed interest in completing it someday, but as of now, nothing has happened. It's always interesting to go back to a director's very first film, because these films act like a journey into an artist's unfiltered mind. I used to feel so sorry for those guys in women's shoes. These ladies would come in and try on about 50 pairs of shoes, They'd make the guys fit them for, I don't know, could be 50 or 60 pairs of shoes until they'd finally make up their mind. Yeah, but I have a foot fetish, so it kind of evened itself out. <laughs> Something's Got to Give was a 1962 film directed by George Cooker, with Marilyn Monroe and Dean Martin starring in the lead roles. The film was a remake of 1940's My Favorite Wife. This would have been Monroe's final film for 20th Century Fox, but complications in her life halted production of the film. On April 11th, two weeks before production began, Monroe was found unconscious in her room from an overdose of barbiturates. Fox was asked to delay the shoot for her health, which they denied. Monroe only appeared sporadically on set, calling in sick most of the time. Just days after her 36th birthday, Monroe suffered a major breakdown in her mental health and was fired days later. Producers attempted to salvage the film by recasting her, but the project was promptly shut down. A lawsuit was filed against her, but was dropped a month later in favor of offering her the same role with a new director. She agreed and even seemed to be happy with her revised script. However, before production began, Marilyn Monroe was found dead at her home due to an overdose of barbiturates. Only preliminary footage of George Cooker's film remains of Monroe's performance. In 1998, Warner Brothers was looking to reboot the Superman franchise after the abysmal release of Superman 4. Kevin Smith pitched a screenplay adaptation of The Death of Superman to producer John Peters. Eventually, director Tim Burton was brought on board, and Nicolas Cage was set to play Superman. Quite the odd choice. After spending $30 million in pre-production, the film was ultimately scrapped, with John Peters being the main culprit. It seemed like Peters was more interested in how many toys a film could sell rather than the actual quality of the film. You bring these kids into the office who would look at our drawings, never look at us, and start commenting, going, Oh, I like that one. I, I hate this. All that remains of this film is footage of Nicolas Cage doing some costume tests. The One Second Film is a non-profit collaborative art project by Nirvan Mullik. The film is just one second of animation, consisting of 12 paintings shot twice to fill up 24 frames of film. These paintings were made by people who attended an International Women's Day event at the California Institute of Art. This project was crowdfunded, and anyone who made a contribution of $1 got their names mentioned in the credits as part of the crew with a making of documentary playing alongside it. Currently, the film is said to have over 56,000 crew members, some even being celebrities. This project started in 2001 
and now, 20 years later, has yet to be released, with the project website being offline since 2019. There have been accusations made against the filmmakers of just taking the money and running. Which is fair when you consider they were trying to crowdfund $1 million. Mullock has moved forward with his film career, with no news mentioning the film since 2016. Big Bugman is a 2006 unreleased animated film about a company worker turned superhero. It starred Brendan Fraser and Marlon Brando in his last acting role before his death. According to the director, Brando was offered the role of the main character, but turned it down in favor of voicing the old lady, Miss Sauer. The man actually got into character to voice her, wearing a wig and dress during the recording. Executive producer Gabriel Grunfeld said Brando described the experience as the most fun he had since playing Julius Caesar. A month later, the actor passed away. The film was set to release between 2006 and 2008, but still remains dormant. All we've really seen is coverage of the film by CNN. I'm kind of cheating with this one here since you can technically still watch this, you just have to go through some hurdles to do it. And the reason for this is very shady. Don's Plum is a 2001 black and white indie film directed by R.D. Robb. It was filmed back in 1995 and starred a young Leonardo DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire. The film is very low budget, with both stars acting in it mainly because they were friends with the people making it. Before the film could even release, both actors took legal action against the director, blocking the film. According to the actors, they were told that the project was only meant to be a short film, so seeing it marketed as a feature film felt like a breach of contract to them. However, according to one of the writers, Dale Wheatley, they never claimed it was going to be a short. Producer David Stutman believes the real reason had to do with the actors' performances. The film had little to no script, meaning most lines were ad-libbed by the actors. Some lines were explicit, or made in a derogatory manner towards the women in the scene, which may have reflected poorly on the actors' real-life beliefs. Of note is that around the same time, three actors from the film, DiCaprio, Maguire, and Kevin Connolly, were also part of the notorious Pussy Posse, a group of male celebrities who roam New York City pursuing girls and causing general mischief. The group began gaining notoriety in 1998, the same year lawsuits were made to suppress the film. Ultimately, the actors were sort of successful. The film was allowed to release anywhere except in the US. Surprisingly, the filmmakers are still pushing for its release someday. There's currently a website called freedonsplum.com, where you can learn more about the controversy and get a copy of the film for yourself from the people who made it. I'm not associated with this website at all, I'm not associated with the people who are running it, so if you do choose to email them and download their film, do it at your own risk. There are a lot of cancelled and unreleased Disney projects that it could become its own iceberg. But I'm not a big Disney fan, so any of you feel free to take that idea from me. It's yours, my friend. However, I will go over a few projects that I found interesting in chronological order. In 1938, Disney had planned to make a sequel to Snow White titled Snow White Returns. The film was storyboarded and planned to use deleted scenes from the original. It was promptly cancelled for unknown reasons. In 1983, Glenn Keane and John Lasseter completed test filming for a Where the Wild Things Are adaptation. It would have used both traditional and computer animation, but didn't go any further than the testing phase. Eventually, Disney lost the rights to Where the Wild Things Are, ending any plans they may have had for it. Disney also wanted to make both a prequel and a sequel to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. The prequel was in development in 1990, 
and was going to be set during World War II, with Roger Rabbit attempting to find his parents. Sounds dumb, but not as dumb as the sequel in development by Robert Zemeckis in 2009. The sequel had some trouble after Bob Hoskins passed away, but not to worry, Zemeckis had the genius idea of using computer effects to add him in. You know, Zemeckis, the director famous for having realistic effects. Neither project has made any significant development. In 2003, a film called My Peoples was being directed by Barry Cook, co-director of Mulan. The story was similar to that of Romeo and Juliet, except set in Texas, with Dolly Parton set to voice the lead role. Development for this was pretty messy. The film's title was being changed constantly from Once in a Blue Moon, to Elegant People, Angel and Her No Good Sister, A Few Good Ghosts. Eventually, the project was scrapped in favor of Chicken Little, a fate worse than death. Speaking of Chicken Little, a sequel was in the works for 2007, promptly cancelled because it was a sequel to Chicken Little. There's also Newt, which was planned to release in 2011, delayed to 2012, but eventually was cancelled. The reason being was that it shared too many similarities with Blue Sky's Rio. Both would have featured an endangered species placed in a sanctuary intended for them to mate, but complications arise. Disney would eventually buy and shut down Blue Sky, so they unfortunately got the last laugh. And finally, there's Gigantic, which was meant to be an adaptation of Jack and the Beanstalk set in Spain. Even during pre-production, the film was being teased in other Disney films like Zootopia. The Easter this Easter egg would age poorly since the project was cancelled in 2017. There are plenty of videos covering all these films in greater detail than I can here, so definitely give those a watch if you're interested. I'll link a few of them down below. So like a week before I started working on this video, concept art for a never-before-seen car spin-off, titled Metro, was leaked onto the most reputable site on the internet, 4chan. Now, not all 4chan leaks are real, but not all of them are fake either. And as it turns out, this one is real. It was confirmed by executive producer Steve Lober that this was a project he had worked on over four years ago, but which was now cancelled. Based on this art, Metro would have been a film about trains in the Manhattan area, and it appears like a huge fire was going to be part of the climax of the film. Even if it's just concept art, the art seems to have a different tone and art style compared to the original Cars film. Loter even called it the edgiest story a Cars film would have. It also seems like being in the Cars universe wasn't an integral part of the film, as he claimed he would have made the film in live action if he still owned the rights to the story. The fact that a never before seen cancelled project like this can just appear out of the blue is pretty wild to me and makes me curious as to what other projects could be leaked in the future. After the failure of Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin, Warner Brothers wanted to get another DC character reboot. Just like with Superman Lives, they chose to adapt one of the characters' darker storylines. For this one, they chose Batman Year One. The story was written by Frank Miller and directed by Darren Aronofsky, at this point in his career having only directed Pi. Actors like Christian Bale and Joaquin Phoenix were considered for the role. However, the film was cancelled before anything could be set in motion. The project mainly fell apart due to creative differences. Miller and Aronofsky had different interpretations of what a dark Batman story looked like, with Aronofsky seemingly taking it too far out of comfort level. But while the two were arguing over a dark story, the executives over at Warner Brothers wanted something campier something they could take their kids to. 
so when presented with their script, they immediately shut it down. While we're on the topic of Batman, let me quickly mention the plans for a Batman vs Superman film. In 2002, it was announced that director Wolfgang Peterson was in talks with Warner Brothers to make a Batman vs Superman film. A screenplay was written, but the project fell through after Peterson decided to direct Troy instead. The only thing that remains of this film is a teaser poster placed in I Am Legend. Just like DC, Marvel has their fair share of cancelled superhero projects. One of the more infamous ones involves Ant-Man and director Edgar Wright. Wright's involvement with Ant-Man actually predates the MCU. He wrote a treatment for the character all the way back in 2003 for Artisan Entertainment, who held the rights for the character at the time. In 2006, he was at Comic-Con with Kevin Feige, announcing his work for Ant-Man. News died down until 2012. Edgar Wright was once again at Comic-Con, announcing Ant-Man, this time with test footage. Unfortunately, conflict arose between Edgar Wright and Marvel Studios over the direction to take the project. Wright wanted Ant-Man to be its own solo standalone film, while Marvel wanted it to be more connected. In May of 2014, Edgar Wright left the project due to creative differences. The test footage is all that remains of his film. Looking back at some comments, part of the hype behind Ant-Man as a film was due to Edgar Wright's involvement. Obviously, the man has a unique style, and it would have been cool to see his take on a superhero film. That said, his style of filmmaking might have been the reason behind the conflict in question. For this story, the aftermath of the film's cancellation is far more interesting than the film itself. Broadway Brawler is a 1997 unfinished romantic comedy directed by Lee Grant and starring Bruce Willis. Plot details are scarce, but it was said to be similar to the film Jerry Maguire released the year prior. Broadway Brawler was in pre-production for two years, and then it went into principal photography for 20 days before production was shut down. The reason being that Bruce Willis was extremely hostile on set, and was unsatisfied with the performance of the cast and crew, going so far as to have some of them fired and replaced. By the time the dust settled, more than half of the film's $28 million budget was spent. This budget was given to them by Disney, and they were not happy. After having to compensate the cast and crew for cutting production early, they turned to Bruce Willis and filed a $17.5 million lawsuit against him. However, the actor managed to take a deal with them in which he would act in three films for the company at a greatly reduced pay cut. This led him to star in Armageddon, The Sixth Sense, and Disney's The Kid. All three movies combined grossed over $1.3 billion worldwide. The footage for Broadway Brawler exists somewhere, but will most likely never be released. Speaking about lawsuits, here's another one for you. The Good Life was a 1997 American crime comedy directed by Alan Merez which was set to star Frank Stallone, younger brother of Sylvester Stallone, who was going to make a cameo in the film. However, both Stallones ended up suing the production after the marketing of the film used excessive footage of Sylvester Stallone's cameo, making it appear as though he was a star of the film. He sued for $20 million, which was his salary for a lead role at the time. The lawsuit was settled out of court two years later, with no details ever being disclosed. The only footage we have of the film comes from this really grainy CNN segment covering the lawsuit. The trailer that initially sparked this whole controversy has never been re-uploaded. Now, I've never played a Halo game, 
but it doesn't take a diehard fan to know that the recent Halo series on Paramount wasn't great and even deeply upsetting for some fans. But there was potential for it to be better. In 2005, Microsoft began the process of adapting Halo for the big screen. They hired Alex Garland to write a screenplay for the film and pitched the idea to multiple studios. Eventually, 20th Century Fox and Universal Pictures would partner to produce the film. Peter Jackson was approached to direct the film, but he decided to give the project over to Neil Blomkamp, a relatively unknown director at the time. Several pieces of concept art and models were made, all of which went through Bungie and Microsoft. Reportedly, Bungie loved his ideas, but Microsoft was not happy. Blomkamp wanted the film to be more grounded and mature, while Microsoft wanted pure spectacle. Creative differences and budget problems ultimately killed the project. Blomkamp would direct a few live-action shorts for Halo 3, which served as a glimpse into what could have been. Godzilla's first venture into Hollywood wasn't great, but it did have the chance to be very different. In 1983, director Steve Miner took a shot at pitching Toho, a Hollywood-produced Godzilla film with A-list actors. This would mark the first time anyone tried to make an American Godzilla film. Miner hired Fred Decker to write a script knowing that Decker wasn't a fan of Godzilla. His intention was to make a movie that would be interesting even without the presence of the monster. This film also intended to use stop motion animation and actors in creature suits, similar to the original film. Most studios actually showed interest in the film, but deemed the project too expensive. With Miner being an unknown director, the project ultimately faded into obscurity. Before the success of Denis Villeneuve's Dune, an adaptation of the book was thought to be unfilmable. This was due in part to Alejandro Jodorowsky's 1974 attempt and failure at making his own version of Dune. In proper Jodorowsky fashion, the idea to make Dune came not out of respect for the work, a book he hadn't even read before, but because a lucid dream told him to make the film. Khodorovsky is best known for his insanely creative surrealist imagery in films like El Topo and The Holy Mountain. And Dune was no exception. He hired talented artists like Chris Foss to design his spaceships, and French illustrator Mobius to create storyboards. Even Dan O'Bannon, a special effects artist who would later work on Star Wars, was hired to work on the visual effects for Dune. Hodorowsky even had a pretty crazy cast consisting of people like Salvador Dali, set to play the Emperor, and Orson Welles set to play Baron Harkonnen. All pre-production for the film was complete, with the entire film having been storyboarded. A few books were even made consisting of all the storyboard and design work done for the film. Unfortunately, a few factors held it back. One, Hodorowsky wanted this to be a 10-hour epic film, a tough sell for studios who felt that the sci-fi genre had already peaked with 2001 A Space Odyssey. The film was also way too expensive to make, if it could even be made at all. A lot of the effects Hodorowsky wanted for his film was near impossible to make using the technology at the time, and so years of work had to be shelved. However, all of this material would resurface with the release of the documentary, Hodorowsky's Dune, in 2013. Not only did the film have insane visuals, but it even had insane stories behind the production. I can't explain it all here, so if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. So you can see for yourself why this is considered to be the greatest film never made. Following 2001 A Space Odyssey, Kubrick planned to make a film about the life of Napoleon. Fascinated by the French leader's life and self-destruction, 
Kubrick spent a great deal of time planning the film's development and conducted over two years of research into Napoleon's life, reading several hundred books and gaining access to his personal memoirs and commentaries. From it, he created a 148-page screenplay, which you can still read now. He even planned to shoot on the very turf Napoleon fought on, and would use 40,000 infantrymen and 10,000 cavalrymen from the Romanian army to help reenact his battles. In 1971, all seemed well in the pre-production phase, with MGM set to produce the film. However, management change at the studio had new investors halt the film, deeming it too expensive. At the time, another Napoleon film, Waterloo, had a disappointing performance at the box office, making other studios feel the project was just too risky. And so, with only test photos remaining, Kubrick's Napoleon project was shelled for good. When Orson Welles passed away, he left behind a tremendous amount of unfinished films. It would take a long time to go over all of them, so I'm going to focus on the ones I found interesting. In 1942, Orson Welles was hired by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to make a four-part travelogue for Brazil, in an effort to foster inter-American relations with them. Welles ended up making a trilogy of documentaries focusing on societal issues of the time. One of them even focused on fishermen who were attempting to speak to the president about the exploitation of their profession. Neither the American or Brazilian administration were happy, and the project was swiftly cancelled. Some of the remaining footage was used in the documentary, It's All True. In 1969, Wells was commissioned by CBS to adapt Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. Filming was done in Yugoslavia and Venice, and was completed by 1970. All was well until two reels of the work print, complete with master sounds, were stolen from the production office. The negative footage still remains, but sound exists for only one reel. The project was obviously shelved. That same year, Wells started work on The Deep, his adaptation of the novel Dead Calm. The film was shot over two years off the coast of Croatia. Only the ending remained to be filmed, but Wells was not satisfied with the footage he had shot. He suspended the project and instead focused on completing the film, F for Fake. Unfortunately, during this time, Lawrence Harvey, one of the main actors, passed away, making it impossible to film the finale. The surviving footage was featured in the documentary, The One Man Band. And finally, during the 1960s, Wells was interested in adapting the classic story of Don Quixote. It was to be set in then modern day Spain, with one scene even taking place in a movie theater. The five year production faced a few problems. Actress Patty McCormick, who began filming at the age of 12, had grown up by the end of production, with her scenes now having to be altered. Later, Akim Tamarov, the actor playing Sancho Panza, passed away during second unit work in 1972. Everything was shot except for a suitable ending. Despite all of this, Wells still tried editing what he had until his death in 1985. The film still incomplete. Now, there have been multiple versions made of his film after his death, but the more well-known version was made by Jesus Franco. This version was made using lower quality footage, used scenes from other Wells films, and was generally not well received. A proper version of Wells' Don Quixote may never exist. Humor Risk is a 1921 unreleased silent comedy film starring the Marx Brothers in their first film roles. For those who might not recognize the Marx Brothers, you might recognize this mirror bit from their film Duck Soup, which has been parodied quite often. 
Anyways, plot details for this film are scarce. Reportedly, it would have had a very different comedy routine compared to the work they're known for now. It's most likely for this reason why it became lost. One version of the story states that Groucho Marx was unhappy with the film's quality and intentionally burned the negative after a bad premiere screening. Another version of the story says it might have been thrown out after it was left in the screening box overnight. Regardless of how it was lost, the film is unlikely to appear again. Since its release, Alfred Hitchcock had toyed around with the idea of making a prequel to its film, A Shadow of a Doubt. He was intrigued with the idea of making a serial killer the central character of a film. So, in 1967, he began work on a film known as Kaleidoscope. The story would follow a sexual psychopath as he kills three victims, one a United Nation employee near a waterfall, the second an art school student, and the third would have been an undercover policewoman who he fights near an oil refinery. Hitchcock shot test footage, which he pitched to Universal. Despite his enthusiasm, the studio denied him the project, feeling it was too explicit and controversial, and would ruin the Hitchcock brand. While this story was scrapped, some elements of Kaleidoscope found their way into Hitchcock's frenzy, released in 1972. Fight Harm was a 1999 film project by director Harmony Corrine. The project would have consisted of Corrine going up to strangers in the streets of Manhattan and provoking a fight without throwing the first punch. Basically one of those YouTube prank channels if they were real. Production for this film was halted for a number of reasons. Injuries from the fights would keep him in the hospital, and assault charges would land him in jail. After nine fights, the project was abandoned. Kareen hadn't considered that street fights, real street fights, aren't really all that lengthy. So he only had a few minutes of what was supposed to be a 90 minute project. Footage is claimed to exist on Kareen's phone, and was said to have been exhibited at the alleged gallery in New York. Only images of his injuries post-fight have ever been seen by the public. Perhaps not a well-known fact, but director Charlie Chaplin was quite intrigued with the life of Napoleon. So much so that he wanted to adapt his life for the big screen. His intrigue peaked in 1931, when, during a publicity tour for his film City Lights, an assistant recommended Charlie Chaplin read a romantic novel by Jean-Paul Weber about Napoleon's exile to St. Helena. He secured the rights for the story and began work on a screenplay. The story involved Napoleon coercing a double to take his place at St. Helena. He returns to Paris a reformed, more peaceful man and manages a bookstore. All this tied together with Chaplin's comedy. However, the screenplay would never materialize into a real film. Instead, in 1938, Chaplin focused on a different dictator in his film The Great Dictator. Dreaming Machine was supposed to be Satoshi Kon's fifth feature film. Unlike his previous work, this film would have been geared more towards a younger audience with the story revolving around three robots going on a fantasy adventure. Unfortunately, on August 24, 2010, director Satoshi Kon passed away from pancreatic cancer. Before passing, Kon expressed concern over not being able to finish his project for Madhouse. While Madhouse co-founder Masao Moriyama promised the film would be complete, complications quickly arose. While Satoshi Kon left plenty of notes that could be used as a guide for the film's completion, there was still some details omitted. Like the use of music by a frequent collaborator, Susumu Hirosawa, who was not able to confirm which songs belonged to which scenes before Kon's passing. As usual, budgetary problems arose, but ultimately the main problem facing the project was that no director could replicate Satoshi Kon's unique vision for filmmaking. As of now, 
600 of the film's 1,500 shots have been completed, but only concept art has been made public. It is unlikely the film will ever be finished or released. In the late 1930s, animator and special effects artist Ray Harryhausen was determined to make a stop-motion animated film on H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. The inspiration for this came after hearing Orson Welles's 1938 radio broadcast of the story. Popular rumor has it that this broadcast caused mass panic, but original sources for these claims are unreliable. Check out this video for more information on that. Anyways, working alone on the project, Harry Hassan created test sequences along with storyboards and sketches. He took the project to various studios, but none of them showed any interest. He did manage to get in contact with filmmaker George Paul, who worked at Paramount and showed enthusiasm in the film. However, Paramount was already working on their own version of the film, and in 1951, they signed with H.G. Wells' heirs to gain exclusive rights to the property. This deal marked the end of Harry Hassan's dream project, living on only as test footage. Following the release of Synecdoche, New York, filmmaker Charlie Kaufman began to work on a musical comedy project known as Frank or Francis. Much like his previous work, this film would have been a meta-narrative, placing the focus this time on Hollywood. The story would follow conflict between Frank, a critically acclaimed director played by Steve Carell, and Francis, a jaded internet blogger played by Jack Black. Other characters were set to appear, like a washed-up actor played by Nicolas Cage, and a Michael Bay-esque director who would have been promoting another soulless and tasteless blockbuster titled Hiroshima. Based off his previous work for films like Adaptation, we know Kaufman had his criticisms of Hollywood, one of which being that studios and audiences would rather watch something more traditional and commercially safe rather than something more experimental and unique. Ironically, this problem would be the exact reason for Frank or Francis' cancellation. Synecdoche, New York, a critically acclaimed, high-concept film, and which many people would consider his magnum opus, bombed at the box office. Add on top of that the economic crisis of 2008, and Hollywood was no longer interested in making films like Synecdoche, New York or even adaptation. Frank or Francis was supposed to be a commentary on the changing landscape of Hollywood, and, in a way, the film's cancellation did just that. A Princess of Mars was supposed to be the first ever animated feature film, Sadly, it wasn't made, and it was even more tragic when it finally was. In his early teenage years, director Bob Clampett, known now for his work on early Looney Tunes cartoons, wanted to make an adaptation of Edgar Rice Burroughs' classic sci-fi series, A Princess of Mars. Clampett actually got the blessing of the author himself, and would work on the film on his own for over five years. In 1936, Clampett presented test footage to Burroughs and MGM, who were impressed by his work, with MGM even offering to distribute the film. Unfortunately, the film may have been a hit with the studio, but not with audiences. Test screenings were abysmal, and honestly a sad reminder of how general audiences view the medium of animation. Even with animation being untested territory, Test audiences felt that this high-concept film was too scary for kids and too childish for adults. I guess nothing changes, even decades later. All these characters hold such a special place in our hearts because animated films make up some of our most formative movie experiences as kids. So many kids watch these movies over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Mm. And over. I see some parents out there know exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> Sketches of the test footage still remain, 
but ultimately Clampett lost enthusiasm with the project as he moved on to work at Warner Brothers. A year later, Snow White would become the first animated feature film, an important film that shaped animation history to come. One can only wonder where we would be if Clampett could make his film first. However, studios weren't done with A Princess of Mars. Disney kept trying to make the project work for decades until eventually, John Carter hit the big screen. And wow, did that bomb. Now this is a very unfortunate story. In 1945, Astrid Lindgren created a series of stories following her character Pippi Longstocking, a young girl with superhuman strength. Her books were immense hits and have been translated to 76 languages. So unsurprisingly, the story made its way to a young Hayao Miyazaki in 1971. In 1971, Miyazaki and collaborator Izao Takahata began pre-production work on a film adaptation of the story. Taking a trip over to Sweden, they met with Lindgren and presented her their work. However, she denied them permission to make the film, ending the project. While it's never been confirmed, the reason for her denial may have to do with previous adaptations. The first adaptation of her story was in 1949 and had a 26-year-old actress playing her 9-year-old character, which greatly upset her. Since then, Lindgren had been very protective of her character. However, a decade later, she finally opened up to adaptations of the character. Unfortunately, the 1988 US film was critically panned, and a 1997 Canadian animated film was a box office flop. Studio Ghibli, on the other hand, was doing just fine. Director Sergio Leone was no stranger to Hollywood meddling. In 1984, Leone's film, Once Upon a Time in America, had his runtime cut down by almost half, an act that almost made him quit filmmaking forever. However, Leone was still interested in one project, an adaptation of the Nazi-Russian conflict at Leningrad between 1941 and 1944. However, this was a gruesome topic that not many studios wanted to touch. Leone continued making plans for his film, visualizing ideas for his opening, which would be a one-take shot of an entire battlefield. Much like Kubrick, Leone was interested in realism and wanted at least 400 tanks for battlefield recreation. As his imagination continued to grow, so did the film's proposed budget. If the controversial topic wasn't enough to dissuade studios, the cost sure did. In 1988, things started to take form when it was revealed that a few Soviet film studios had agreed to help with the budget. However, in 1989, a few days before he could pitch the idea to studios in Los Angeles and truly cement production agreements, Sergio Leone would die of a heart attack. All that remained or ambitious ideas for an opening. Most know Salvador Dali as the famous surrealist painter, but he also made a name for himself in the world of cinema. Zelcher fans will know him as the co-director of Un Chant en Delu, alongside my favorite director, Luis Buñuel. However, Buñuel stayed making foreign films, whereas Dali set his sights on Hollywood, hoping to inject the art of surrealism into American filmmaking. He particularly enjoyed Marx Brothers films as he felt they employed a type of surrealist comedy in their art. So Dali wrote and pitched them a screenplay, injecting it with tons of surrealist imagery. The screenplay was thought to be lost for quite some time until in 1996, it was found amid Dolly's papers. In March of 2019, the screenplay was turned into a graphic novel, and a few months later, a soundtrack was made to go alongside it. While it never became the feature film Dolly wanted, it's nice to see that the story still lives on decades later. In 
In 1965, surrealist director Federico Fellini signed a contract with Italian producer Dino De Laurentiis to make the film The Voyage of G. Mastorna. Production was going well, Laurentiis made large investments, and elaborate sets were even made. But for reasons we'll never really know, Fellini pulled the plug on the project. A costly decision which led Laurentiis to take legal action against him although he would continue working with the director even after this ordeal. Efforts were made to revive the project even 20 years later, but nothing ever got off the ground. We only get to see fragments of what might have been in Fellini's documentary, A Director's Notebook. In 1993, the year of his death, he encouraged French cartoonist Milo Manara to make a comic strip based on his script for the film. Much like Dali's screenplay, Fellini's story is able to live on in a different medium. In 1964, French director Henri-Georges Clouseau set out to make one of his most ambitious films, Inferno. It was to tell the story of a hotel manager consumed by jealousy of his young wife. It was going to be shot using experimental techniques, most notably the psychedelic effects of the climax. Despite Columbia giving him unlimited resources and creative freedom, the film still went through development hell. For one, the film was shot at a hotel in France near an artificial lake. The lake was integral to the film, but was scheduled to be drained in 20 days. So every important shot had to be completed before then. However, Clouseau was both a perfectionist and a spontaneous filmmaker. He would demand numerous takes of a scene and think of new ideas on the spot. A bad combination for someone on a tight schedule. Morale waned as production became more intense. Eventually, the lead actor left the project claiming he was ill. And after Clouseau's own heart attack, Columbia ended the project. All that remained were a few clips of Rami Schneider's performance in this strange fever dream of a film. The American, also known as The Flag Makers, is a 1927 Western film directed by J. Stewart Blackton. The film was announced in January of that year and was being produced by George K. Spohr through his company, Natural Vision Pictures. This was going to be the first film made using a new experimental widescreen process called Natural Vision, one of cinema's earliest attempts at creating 3D film technology. Other companies had attempted making 3D films before, but they were usually short films or just test footage. The American, later changed to Flag Makers, was going to be the first feature-length film in 3D. All seemed well, the film was making good progress and wrapped up filming by February. It was set to show at New York's Roxy Theater, which was being equipped with new technology that could show the film in natural vision. And then, radio silence. While the film's cancellation announcement has been lost to time, we can infer, based on statements made by Blackton, that producer George Spohr felt the film was poorly made and scrapped the rather expensive project. The last update came in October, where Blackton fought back against these claims, urging Spore to let the audience decide whether the film was good or not. Nothing ever came of this. As it turns out, conflicts between directors and producers is a tale as old as time. And with that, we conclude our iceberg for tonight. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, give it a like and a comment down below. And I would say subscribe, but I won't. The last time I made an iceberg, I got an influx of subscribers. It was insane. And in the moment, I was very happy. But I soon came to the realization that all these people were here for more iceberg content, which is fine. But icebergs are my side content. They're my most successful content for sure, but I still consider it my side content. 
If you do consider subscribing, I highly suggest watching my other videos, which I know is not for everyone. Currently, my banner says I talk about films that no one cares about. I am well aware that I make very niche content for a niche audience. So to the people who stuck around and watched all of it, and commented how much you enjoyed it, thank you. It means a lot to me. My point with all this is that, be aware of what you're getting into. If you want more iceberg content, there are plenty of channels out there that mass produce that stuff every day. My channel is not one of them. With all that said, shout out to the patrons as per usual. You guys are awesome. Happy holidays to everyone. I hope this one actually gets out before the holidays end. And happy new year to you all.